Hello and welcome to the public program New Directions, Decolonizing the Museum and Public Art. My name is Andrea Nyberg Forshage and I will be moderating the conversation this evening. Today's talk is the first of a series of programs on decoloniality and public art produced by Public Art Agency Sweden to be continued through collaborations with Luleå Biennial and Gibka, as well as a seminar reflecting on the Public Art Agency Sweden itself. Today, we're streaming live from Nordiska Museet, the Nordic Museum in Stockholm. And I would like to thank Nordiska Museet for hosting us. This stream will be archived through our website, and there's a chat function for which all viewers are warmly welcome to pose questions for the Q&A at the end. We are here as this year sees the inauguration of artist Ute Pieski's public artwork, Two Directions, for the new entrance to Nordiska Museet, commissioned by Public Art Agency Sweden. With us today are Ute Pieski, the artist, Sanne Hobby Nilsson, director of Nordiska Museet, Gunnar Guttorn, professor in Doji, and Elin Kristina Hagdal, professor in art history, as well as curator Peter Hagdal and head of experience Vanessa Gandhi. As stated by the artist, two directions taking formal cues from Sami works currently in the museum collection stands as a symbol for the importance of continued processes of repatriation and rematriation in regard to the colonization of Sápmi. This year, movements for black and indigenous lives have yet again pushed questions of decoloniality to the forefront of public discussion globally and in Nordic, Sami and Swedish contexts. However, as much in the areas of art and museums as in society at large, these are far from new discussions. The practices of decoloniality are rooted in struggles ongoing since the beginning of colonialism, even preceding it, as not only a reaction to colonial power, but rather ways of continually undoing coloniality and ways of doing otherwise. As a government agency working to develop public art, the Public Art, art Agency Sweden also plays a part in creating the very structures that are consolidated and upheld in society. A decolonial, decolonial understanding alerts us to the urgency of examining this role. What might this entail? The public sphere, art, museums, are all modern categories, contemporaneous with European colonialism. Material and visual cultures form a part of these material conditions, which can be understood and might be remade through decoloniality as practice. As scholars Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang have established, decolonization is not a metaphor. Just as art, artworks entangle the material and the symbolic, as we might see in the work of Uti Pieski, questions of material and institutional power, sovereignty and land are at the center of discussions around contemporary art, cultural memory, architecture and public space. A decolonial understanding is thereby necessarily unsettling to institutions as it impels us to look at the ways in which we are enmeshed in the colonial present. Moreover, it is a compelling invitation to consider the ways that precisely this enmeshment might offer ways of finding new directions in the work of undoing or dismantling coloniality. Delving into the artwork two directions, we hope to take part in and open up for continued dialogues and practices relating to decolonization in Sami, Swedish and Nordic contexts. Asking how museums and public art might work toward becoming sites of material change. To start the program, I would like to give the floor to Vanessa Gandhi, head of museum experience at Nordiska Museet, and Peter Hagdal, curator at Public Art Agency Sweden, who will tell us more about the artwork and the process of making it. Welcome. Thank you. So to place this art piece in a bit of a context for the museum, we've actually worked with a general plan for the whole museum to open, open the museum up and actually invite more people in. And the actual art project has been 
with the engines has been carrying on for at least five years. So when I started in 2016, this project was actually on the table. And we had uh, an architect called Lone Pierre Bach, who's been working with a lot of the different uh, updates for the museum. And one of the big ideas was to open up an entrance towards the back, where we have a big flow of people going to the uh, other museums around. So we actually opened up the backyard and she placed a huge lantern that would uh, sort of welcome people into the museum. And uh, then we quickly found out that this is not just an entrance, this is actually an art portal. And we started thinking about who do we want to have as an artist to actually come in and make a permanent art piece for the, for the museum. And we said that we wanted to have someone who carried the same symbolic storytelling that we actually already have in the building. So we have traditions from Karl Eld, Karl Milles and August Strindberg, uh, words that we actually have uh, engraved in the building. And so we thought maybe we need uh, a partner for this project. And we quite quickly found, of course, the Public Art Agency of Sweden. And we said the brief was something aligned with uh, that we wanted somebody to actually be uh, somebody who could be a statement for 2020 and the Nordics. And that's where you came in the picture, Peter. Yeah, it, uh, it's been extremely challenging and quite interesting to work with Nordic Museum, Nordiska Museet, because it's such a specific uh, situation. Uh, this is an old uh, 19th century building uh, which hosts greatly ornamented from, mm. from that time. So uh, to connect that to contemporary art was one of the main challenges, of course. And uh, the museum as such is also a, a, a Nordic museum, uh, bridging over the collection of, of lots of, of craft things from, from all over the, the Nordic sphere. So that was, of course, one of the main um, uh, yeah, mm. main de de departures to, to take this. And of course, it's nice to work with uh, contemporary art because it's uh, what you do now uh, will make a sort of a mark for the future, which is, of course, as Carl L, the old uh, sculptures here, they, it, it's tattooed in the building. So mm. now we have a new tattoo on this building that will bring a certain uh, signifying uh, message to the future, of course. Mm. But then again, to, to work with the, uh, the, 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 the work of, of, of placing an artwork mm. was, of course, um, uh, we, we quite fast realized that we should look upon the collection and see the, what way you could visualize whatever what's inside. And mm. of course, the Satmi, the Sami culture is, of course, extremely vital uh, part of the collection. So, to more to, to reverse the idea of, of the content of the museum and make it visible in the entrance was uh, one of the uh, key points in mm. this uh, thing. And then, of course, uh, lots of our work in the public art agency in Sweden is a, a, a matchmaking. Mm. trying to identify an artist that you that you believe could do the, the the work and to find to be able to work with Uti was such a nice um, experience I have to say because he's an extremely talented contemporary artist mm. uh, and uh, had and the we took a long time to find her I, yeah we, we took our time to find we, the right one we always mm. do this mm. um, uh, quite thoroughly uh, mm. this um, work but yeah it took some time yeah mm. Um, but then, uh, and she is, she's of course, uh, she's been, uh, I saw her in many uh, exhibitions in Finland actually. Mm. And that's why, why we connected her to this project. Mm. Uh, yeah. And what do you think has been most challenging with the project? Yeah, the challenging is of course the idea of the reversing the idea from a small, uh, the, what Uti identified was this small spoon. Mm. And uh, that's extremely handy object uh, and to reverse that thing into this gigantic entrance that's uh, and to see it for real uh, and the scale of this that's uh, of course one of the most uh, inspiring thing mm. and like translating we talked a lot about translating from the paper to the the steel material that maybe wasn't significant significant for her art she's been more in in painting and in textiles Textile, yeah. um, and I think that when I come to work every day and I go into that entrance that we've been working on for so long, I think what's most astonishing is sort of that we actually, it's exactly the same as the poetry in, in Uti's tactile sketches from day one. Yeah. 
and we actually managed to translate that. I think that's fantastic. And I think now we have a film that shows the actual process and a bit more about the, um, the that's connection right. to the collection. That's right, we have a film uh, which we can we will show now. Nordiska museet grundades av Artur Aselius och är idag Sveriges största kulturhistoriska museum. Arkitekten Isak Gustav Claesson ritade den ikoniska byggnaden som 1907 öppnades på Djurgården. Byggnaden är idag ett arkitektoniskt landmärke med tinnar och torn, spiror och höga gavlar. Här hittar vi drag av dansk renaissance men också inspiration från Gripsholm och Vasterna slott. Fasaden och den stora tempelliknande porten mot Djurgårdsvägen är rikt dekorerad av skulpturer och reliefer med referenser till nordisk mytologi och historia. Nu öppnar en ny entré med konstnärlig gestaltning på museets västra sida. Byggnadens fasad som vände sig mot galärparken, vattnet och strandvägen var en minst lika viktig del av den arkitektoniska helhetsupplevelsen. Satsningen är en del av museets långsiktiga plan att öppna upp och göra museet tillgängligt för fler. Till den konstnärliga gestaltningen av den nya entrén har konstnären Oti Pieski bjudits in. Med hennes verk Two Directions synliggörs en viktig del av nordisk och samisk kulturarv som nu får ett permanent avtryck i museets byggnadshistoria. Oti Pieski ansluter därmed till skaran av museets ursprungliga konstnärer Carl Milles, Carl Eld och August Strindberg. Bakom mig syns ju då den vår nya entré Two Directions. Och eh, det är också en magisk upplevelse att få äntligen se den på plats. Det är faktiskt så att flera generationer eh, led ledningar för Nordiska museet har planerat för en ny entré. Och det finns lite olika tankar eh, kring hur en entré skulle kunna se ut, lite olika lösningar. Men det är först nu att, att det har landat. Och, så det betyder att det faktiskt är en väldigt gammal dröm som äntligen nu går i uppfyllning. Och det handlar naturligtvis om en dröm om inte bara en ny entré, men en dröm om att publiken ska kunna ta till sig hela den underbara byggnad Nordiska museets västra fasad, det vill säga den fasad som vänder mot slottet och mot vattnet. Um, och så handlar det naturligtvis också om att skapa en entré på markplan så att alla eh, kan ta sig in i, i vår stora byggnad på, på lika villkor. Of course it has been a great honor to have this opportunity to uh, make the artwork to Nordiska museet. Uh, it's like my personal uh, honor but uh, also I see it as an, a strong message from the museum that they have chosen a Sami artist to create this work. In my experience, uh, the museum is uh, full of magic, a space uh, where you can feel the strong connection uh, with your ancestors. The visual starting point for the work has came from the items from the museum Sami collection. I see the old uh, Sami decoration tradition as a language and there uh, every single uh, decor element is a word and uh, together they create an ornamental story about the Sami philosophy, cosmology and li livelihood. So therefore the, the Sami collection in, in the Nordiska Museet can be seen as a library of, of Sami knowledge. And that is especially why I'm so interested about this collection. And, and this, my work, I, I hope it's, uh, it reflects this collection. And this collection that um, uh, in, includes objects from, from different Sami origins. While I'm uh, personally uh, from Northern Sami area, Uh, in this my work there is also in 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 major role the southern sami areas uh, ornamental uh, tradition sammankopplingen eller kopplingen mellan entrén 
dekorationen och utsmyckningen och vår samling den är så pass viktig så jag vill faktiskt gärna visa skeden som har varit den primära inspiration till konstverket. Då kan jag ju i mellantiden avslöja att det rör sig om en sked från det så kallade sydsamiska området där motiven är lite annorlunda än i den norrliga del. Och det är just de här geometriska mönstren som är så karaktäristiska för det sydsamiska med en så de i det norrliga området lite mer växtbetonade. Då hoppas jag att det ses väldigt tydligt att i taket då har vi egentligen en, en sked med ett uh, underbart, uh, väldigt symboliskt motiv där olika världar bokstavligen flätas ihop. Längs med sidorna på entrén Ja, då återfinner ni detaljerna från bland annat det här föremål men också andra föremål. Så med denna här entré, då gör vi någonting som jag inte tror jag känner igen från något annat museum. Vi, vi knyter helt enkelt ihop våra samlingar med museets arkitektur. Och det är ju det som museibyggnaden egentligen är känd för på ett, ett väldigt tydligt sätt knyp, knyter ihop både dåvarande svenska konstnärer men också företeelser från den nordiska mytologi och religion och folkliv i sin utsmyckning och dekoration. Och nu gör vi detta med ett sydsamiskt föremål på eh, ett, ett, ett storskaligt sätt. When this uh, repatriation, it, it means uh, reciprocity and uh, equal dialogue. And it has two directions. One is that the items will go back to their home areas. And the other is we all who visit the museum, also the Sami people, we can walk into the museum and feel that this museum is for everybody, that it's telling story from our history and from our perspective. So I, I hope this artwork can symbolize this process. In the Sami culture, there is three goddess sisters, Sarahka, Uksahka and Yoksahka. And this new entrance uh, is placed for, for Uksahka. Uksa is meaning door. And uh, this Uksahka is uh, living next to the doorway and is, it's, um, it is connected to the idea of transition and, and new beginnings. Right, welcome back to the lounge. I am now honored to present with us live um, Ute Pieski, uh, joining us by video link from Finland. And by way of introduction, Ute Pieski is a Sami visual artist based in Utsjoki and Numinen, Finland. Her work delves into the Arctic region and the interdependence of nature and culture, combining the Sami handicraft tradition of doji and contemporary art practices to reopen conversations about the Sami people within transnational discourses. Pieski has exhibited in Sápmi and internationally over two decades and was most recently awarded the Finnish Cultural Foundation Grand Prize in 2020. And with that, over to you, Ulti. Thank you. Uh, thank you for Nordiska Museet and the Public Art Agency Sweden for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I, um, I will share my, my screen and show a uh, PowerPoint uh, while I'm speaking. Okay, hope, hope you can see my, my first slide. Um, good evening to everybody. The guiding drumming is not reaching into our ears from the museum cellars. We cannot hear our ancestors whispering under the earth because their heads are stolen. How can we learn back the healthy way of living when we are missing guidance from our ancestors. The museum belongings are our dictionaries, 
our guiding books for how to live as human beings in reciprocity with nature. That is why we need to get our belongings back home to Sapmi. The Sami collection in Nordiska Muset is the biggest Sami collection outside the Sami region, with over, over 6,000 inventory numbers that may include over 13,000 objects. Only a small, small number can be publicly displayed when the rest is lying in the cellars. Uh, the first Sami object purchased to the collection is from year uh, 1872 in a south, is a sa southern Sami woman's belt uh, with spoon, purse and spoon. There are 182 objects dating before the 19th century. Those old objects are really rare and true treasures for our early from our early ancestors. There are belongings from all, all over uh, Sápmi in Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Russia. There is a large collection that contains the oldest objects taken from today's Finnish side of Sápmi, the Eanodat Enontekia area. This means that in this area, today's society cannot reach their ancestors' belongings, but they need to live without access to their cultural heritage. There are plenty of our ancestors' bones and skulls in different human osteological collections, and no one understands nowadays why they have been robbed. There is a vast amount of Sami religious material, including sacrificial objects, seipis, drums, and archaeological material, such as sacrificial sites, graves, and bone materials. My first visit to the collection was uh, in year 2018, together with researcher Eva Kristina Harlin, when we went to visit our foremother's hats called Latyokafir. The visit was part of our interdisciplinary repent rematriation project, Matarahku Latyokahvir, for a mother's hat of pride, where we studied the Latyokahvir hat worn by Sami women until the end of 19th century. With the help of museum objects, we have been studying the effects of colonialism on Sami women. By studying this forgotten tradition of Latyokahvir, we have been searching for many new meanings of the Latyokahvir together with Sami women. This tradition has been revitalized in our workshops and simultaneously there has been discussions about the position of, position of Sami women in the past and today. Latyokahvir has been rematriated, Erko reincorporated as part of Sami society. We see that Latyokahvi represents the old Sami cosmology, the set of values where all beings are equal. Our project and our publication is an example of the rematriation process where we can rebuild our Sami societies by working collectively with the ancestral belongings. There is a huge need for this kind of healing and learning processes in Sapi. I want to thank the intendant of the Sami collections, Cecilia Hammerlund Larsson from the Nordiska Muset, for the kindest help both during the Latyokahvir project and the public art project for the museum's new entrance. I feel so extremely happy and privileged uh, to be able to enter this hidden world of treasures. But at the same time, I felt deep sorrow and anxiety in my chest. Researching the hats was for me a long-awaited visit to meet the foreign mothers. At the same time, when I felt a deep, warm-hearted connection with the belongings, 
I had the sharp feeling of alienation towards my ancestors. After so many breaks and oblivion, the colonial past has made between us. I was very sorry for myself not to be capable to understand all the messages the foremothers were telling me throughout the belongings. And sorry for the dearest foremothers not being able to take part in their descendants' everyday life. The place of my artwork, Koekte and Piekkese, Koekte Pikki, two directions in the Nuriska Museet entrance, can be seen as a metaphor. Despite the many positive aspects the national museums have in general, they also remind us of the colonial history of many nations. Nordiska Museet has opened the new entrance to welcome more people to visit the museum. For me, it is a sign of repatriation and rematriation, where the artwork is celebrating the ongoing process where belongings and its content are returned from museums back to Sami societies. Repatriation means reciprocity and equal dialogue. It has two directions. That means that we, the Sami, can walk into the museum and feel that this museum is for everybody. That it narrates also our history from our perspective. To be able to do that, there is a need for professionals from the Sami society who are leading the museological work at every level from our perspective, not just from an advisory position. I hope this artwork can be a door for reconciliation, a doorway to welcome the Sami society in, and the doorway to carry our belongings back home. There is a huge need to finally finalize the repatriation processes also in Nordiska Museet, which has been a promised and initiated already in 2007. In Anar, Inari, in the final museological seminar uh, recalling ancestral voices, both of the previous curators of Sami collections, Leif Parelli from Norsk Folke Museum and uh, Lena Palmqvist from uh, Nordiska Museet, stated that Nordiska Museet and Folke Museum are willing to start the discussions on repatriation of the Sami collections. I urge all the involved parties in Swedish and Sami societies to finally take action. The path towards a realized repatriation is already half walked. Many difficult discussions have, have already taken place and the mutual understanding is already there. Thanks to all four walkers, the door is open. Every nation has a right for its own history. The hidden and non-spoken Sami history has made us partly lose our memory and therefore has endangered our ability to build our society towards the future. As we want to point out, decolonialization is a question of real acts, questions of land and water. We also need to point out that repatriation, or re rather rematriation, is a real act, not a symbol or a metaphor. Rematriation starts from where repatriation does not reach. Repat rematriation is the resocializing re the Sami belongings and act an act to make the belongings become a part of living, living Sami society, as researcher Eva Kristina Harlin describes it. This substance brings huge responsibility, not only uh, for the national museums, but also for the Sami museums. It is not accepted for our, for our museums to store the repatriated belongings in their 
their museum cellars and thus continue the hidden politics of national museums. This is why there is a big need to indigenize our museums on many levels. This work needs in the institutional changes. The belongings are forwarding messages across generations and actor, they are act actors in re-remembering, re-educating and communal healing. The ornamentation uh, on my work, is based on the Southern Sami braiding and antler and wood ornamentation, where the diagonal, diagonal structure expresses the flexibility and sociality, and the vertical horizontal structure is a manifestation of firmness and stability. In the ceiling, there is an ornament from a specific Southern Sami spoon made from, made from elk antler. This spoon is made around 1862 by reindeer herder Paul Chakritson, from, who lived first in Frost, Frostviken area and later in Idre Samibu. This is the rare museum item where it is collected and preserved at least this much provenance information. You could say the spoon ornament is carrying the same knowledge as the secret drums. It is a fascinating combination of secret and profane. The object is made for a specific person who carries it with, within and use it in everyday life. And at the same time, it carries the deep knowledge of Sami cosmology. The craft tradition in Sapmi is very rich and it variates a lot between uh, the different Sami regions. At present, there is nine living Sami languages and at least as many craft or Tuotji languages. The South Sami Tuotji tradition is kno known from the most skillfully made ornaments and craft traditions. The ornaments are often geometrical while in Northern Sami area where I am from, there are more uh, representational and based on free lines. Especially the Southern Sami ornament tradition is carrying rich information from the Sami cosmology and philosophy. When the Christianity came to Sapmi in the 17th century, the sacred drums had to be burned and the old world order went to oblivion. After that, the old cosmology and philosophy continued living in the hidden places for example, in the Tuotji tradition, especially in Southern Sami ornaments. That makes this craft tradition so important to all of us in Sapmi, when we can learn back things from the objects and, and from their makers. While creating this artwork, I have learned a lot from the Sami Tuoyar craft maker and Tuotji craft researcher Maya Dunfield, who has made he, her PhD research about South Sami ornamentation. Even though the South Sami Tuotji tradition is not my native language in Tuotji, I have wanted to bring it forward and point out the signific this, uh, significant role of this tradition to all of us in Sapmi. Another reason is that it, it has a major role in the Sami collections of Nordisk Museet, starting from its first purchased object. In the South Sami area, the Tuotji tradition has carried through the hard times of colonial history the significant knowledge of the Sami set of values. This rich cultural heritage is still very alive 
for example, in the ornamentations in spoons, in the Guanquescovia, the collar of the Sami dress, Copto, and even in certain case and cases in the tradition of using the, using the secret drum. But for example, the Southern Sami Museum, Sami and Siete in Snows, Norway, has a very small number of objects in their collection and has an urgent need for repatriation. In Sami culture, the material items hold energy and power in them. The energy comes from the material itself. All natural materials have its energy. It also comes from the maker who has transformed her or his skills, care and love into the item. It comes from the user who has used and lived with the item and the power that comes from the original context. This idea is similar to the philosophy of new materialism, where the material is seen not as a passive, but as an active author. When we welcome our belongings back to home as living ancestors, our Sami museums have a big task to create a real living home for our ancestors. Sami museums need to be active, gathering places that gather past, present and future generations together. A real safe space for us Sami, where the local societies can find their own ways to heal and empower together with the, their belongings. In our spiritual values, there is three goddesses, as I already said in this video presentation. The sisters, Saraka, Uksaka and Yuksaka. The new entrance of the Nordiska Museet is place for Uksaka, Uksa meaning the door. She lives next to the doorway and is connected to the idea of transition and new beginning. Kihtuollu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oti. Uh, and I will just want to say again that there will be time uh, for questions and comments uh, after all of the speakers. Uh, now I want to uh, introduce uh, our next speaker, Sanne Hobie Nilsson, who is the executive director of Nordisk of Nordiska Museet at here in Stockholm which is hosting us today. And um, uh, you're an archaeologist with a doctorate in classical archaeology from mm. the University of Copenhagen. Mm. And you have, and uh, with over 40 years of experience mm. in, the, in museums. Mm. So Long time. <laughs> 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 yes. <coughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the occasion to uh, uh, to speak today, f because it is the Art Council who has arranged this very <coughs> important um, series of lectures uh, dealing with decolonization. And um, uh, I have to say immediately that I'm very <coughs> taken aback by uh, Uchi uh, Pieske's uh, talk. It is, I think, after having listened to uh, uh, to Udi in um, in person, uh, it it's, it it really it it makes a huge impression because, as I think, every everyone who has just listened to you, Udi, uh, will <coughs> I think feel and experience how much objects actually mean uh, still today. Objects that are uh, ancient, objects that are old, objects that have uh, belonged to other people who lived for a long time ago in a world that was completely different from our world today. And uh, <coughs> I think what, what makes a huge impression on me is that the Sami, uh, Sami cultures uh, is, is among those cultures in the world that has no oral uh, or written, sorry, no written tradition 
and it is ex an extremely vulnerable uh, culture. And in fact, there are so many cultures and peoples uh, around the world uh, who have no um, uh, written tradition, uh, and they are extremely vulnerable. Our whole history, uh, Western history, uh, our traditions of writing history is uh, and talking about history, talking about cultural history, talking about history, talking about developments and patterns and so forth, is very much still going back to written sources. And if you are not among those, <laughs> uh, if you don't belong to those uh, people who, uh, who were written about, uh, you're really bad off. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, I speak about this because this is, of course, where museums come in. <coughs> museums is about material culture. Muse museums is about uh, collecting objects uh, from not only just cultures and peoples, but also sections of society. It can be women, it can be children, it can be simply sections of society who are not written about. And uh, it can also be aspects about cultures um, that do not enter uh, written sources, uh, but can actually just be reconstructed by means of objects. And in the case of the uh, Sami uh, people and the uh, Sami identities through thousands of years, uh, objects and um, secondary sources are really the sources. So, here in the Nordic Museum, we do have um, many, many objects. Uh, they are actually all digitized, uh, which I would like to uh, point out. They are all available um, uh, in, in picture. Uh, and these are, these are objects, but they are also fragments of people's lives. And uh, it is a painful thing to to uh, bec to constantly be aware of that as uh, as being uh, in charge of a huge institution like the Nordic Museum a very powerful uh, institution housed in a building which is extremely powerful and looking powerful it is actually very painful to think that you are <coughs> you are in charge of of uh, fragments of lives and uh, piecing to together these fragments into personal stories, into personal dis uh, dest uh, destinies and so forth, is something that museums have been doing for a long time. But the big difference now is that most museums, including the Nordic Museum, is that we are opening up uh, as an institution and really, really looking for help uh, to try and piece these fa fragments together and make uh, and make them uh, in a sense alive again and uh, and i hope that this our new entrance um, can can be can can is seen as an, an as an opening as i think you would put it very beautifully it's a it's an opening towards a, a a future where we as a museum as i said we are opening up uh, towards all sorts of uh, people and institutions uh, to to help us piece these um, uh, fragments together and uh, make meaningful stories out of out of the uh, out of the fragments and i think for me you you will have to stop me if i if i speak too long oh, uh, i i have to, i don't have a watch <laughs> um but um, um i think that one of the important things about uh, repatriation uh, the, uh, issues and decolonization uh, issues is that, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, the, um, I think the wording is something that we maybe should be aware of. It doesn't really capture uh, what we are talking about. As you will know, repatriation actually means but back to the fatherland. And who has a fatherland today? Uh, lots of people are living uh, not in their fatherland. Uh, they're dreaming of their fatherland. Uh, and and what is a fatherland? Uh, is a fatherland is also 
maybe the um, the the country or the the uh, your childhood uh, village, your childhood uh, place uh, which you left when you when you married or when you went to a big city or or whatever. There are, there are many you you leave behind you through a lifetime. You leave behind you a lot lots of territories. And uh, I would say that the, um, the the word repatriation, um, I think that I think we should look at it from many many angles. And uh, the same goes for uh, decolonization. You cannot actually decolonize because uh, a colonizing process is a long process, and it has taken place, and it's still going on. Um, it, and decolonizing uh, and colonizing processes processes uh, have a lot lots of of, of faces uh, and unfortunately there are many many partners involved and uh, I think that one of the things that happens in a in a in a colonial uh, process is that you have of course the victims uh, but you also have those who are colonizing. And you have to take in all uh, all accounts today if you if you want to understand objects, uh, the meaning of objects today. Uh, if I to give you an, an example, we we have the uh, very important collections here at the at the Nordiske Museum, and you have to understand that the Nordiske Museum is almost 150 years old. It's uh, the building here is is five generations old, and it means that the collections that we uh, house here, they um, they have created a lot of meanings here, um, and they have created a lot of meanings for all those people that have entered the building and seen the collections here for almost 150 years. Today we have. Um, uh, 15 million people passing by our museum and with the help of the new entrance we will take in an even greater part of those many many visitors to uh, to, to Diogon and a lot of these visitors they are uh, they are they are looking at the sami collections the exhibitions and they are uh, they are um, they are seeing something that is meaningful, even if you are if you do not have a Sami background. As I start out by saying earlier, many people, for for, for many people, these collections tell stories that they can relate to, even if they are not uh, uh, Sami. Uh, uh, it's about loss. It's about. Uh, painful experiences. It's about uh, it's about um, power institutions that uh, make you feel very small and without power. So and in, and it's about beautiful handicraft and art that you actually inspire to new handicraft and new art. So there's so many levels, and this is not to in any way uh, say that. We would that we are not willing to uh, to look at our collections from uh, those angles that are sometimes captured by the word uh, uh, repatriation. But what what I'm trying to say is that today the today the um, the complexity of of housing that kind of collections which we house are so huge because they have become so meaningful. Uh, on a, on so many different levels to so many people, and uh, and it is all of these complexities that we need to to take uh, into account today, and this and this makes it very 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 complex. And and um, yes, sorry, and now uh, you will have to stop me. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, we are yes, running and yes, behind. absolutely. Uh, but but let me let me. Can, can I just say to uh, Uji because um, as my final word that. Um, uh, we are hugely proud of of the entrance, and we are very taken by your by your words. And um, so, thank you for also for for the for the speech you just gave, not only for the art piece. Thank you mm. very much, Sana. And I hope we can also continue uh, talking in the Q and A mm. session, which 
again, all viewers mm -hmm. are also very mm -hmm. welcome to, to contribute with questions mm -hmm. to, uh, to all of the participants, mm -hmm. um, including those by link. Uh, and now I am, uh, again, by video link, I'm honored to introduce um, our next speaker, Gunvor Guttorm, uh, who is a professor in Doji, um, Sami Art and Crafts, Traditional Art and Applied Art at the Sami University College and has written several articles on contemporary Sami handicrafts and about how the traditional knowledge of Sami art and craft is transformed to the, tr to the modern lifestyle. Um, and she has also participated in exhibitions in Sápmi and abroad. So welcome, Gunvor. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me? Or? Yes. Gihtu Boudehusas. Thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Even if I'm now in Gvodegeinu, uh, in northern Norway, I still feel that I am in, um, in Nordiska Museet, uh, where I have been a lot uh, during my research uh, period, because uh, I have... Um, I started with uh, studying Duetje in 1990s and have uh, visited Nordiska Museet doing my master's program and later also my PhD in, 19, in the middle of 1990, uh, in, in 2000, early in 2000. And um, I have been looking, watched closer to the knives. You have you have a lot of knives from all over the Sápmi, and also the Nahbis from from different kind of different areas in Sápmi, and also Latjukahpi that um, that uh, Odi was uh, talking about. So I and um, I appreciate it really. Uh, all this beach and I really look forward to see the entrance that you have made, Odi. So my name is, um, as told, Gunvor Gutton, and I work at um, Sami University or Sami Alla Skola as professor in Dutti. The last years I have been involved in UCA's Office, Office of Contemporary Art Norway exhibit Let the, Let the River Flow as a Sami reference uh, partner together with professor in Sami literature, Haral Gaski. As a uh, follow-up to this exhibit, uh, I have been one of the editors for the book, coming book, Let the River Flow, an indigenous uprising and its legacy in art, ecology and politics, which will be launched early in November. I have also joined another project, which is a cooperation between Sami Alaskula, Sami University of Applied Sciences and Norwegian Crafts, where we collect articles written of some Sami scholars and artists from the 1960s until today about Duetje in different perspectives and in two languages. Sami, which involves Northern, Lule and uh, South and English. Our goal is to make the Sami Duetje voices visible in the world. I am also project leader of um, for Sami Alla Skola in the Ar Arctic Indigenous Design Archives project, which aims to ensure the preservation and continuity of Sami design and Dutti thinking, uh, design and art and Dutti thinking for the future generations. It is a collaborative uh, project between Sami Archive in Inari, Finland, Item Museum in Jokmok, Sweden, and Sami Alla Skola. And it is enabled with Interreg North, North two-year funding. 
in IDA, we uh, we want to present and ask. The, in the IDA, we ask how archives can be uh, indigenized. So this is also a part of the decolonizing perspective. Of course, I'm very glad to work with these projects, not only because it is interesting for me personally, but uh, also because this is part of the decolonizing uh, process. And uh, I mention this because in many ways, I feel that to be part of what happens around Sami Dwetji and art today, with a new interest in the Sami cultural issues, are quite a new phenomena in the history and as part of the Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, and also Russian cultural, cultural establishment. And then I, I don't mean the Sami uh, culture establishment, but the, the Swedish, Norwegian, and Finnish. This, the years Sami have used to struggle with getting political and cultural acceptance have con come one step forward closer to self-determination and self-representation. Uh, self and I will discuss this uh, representation and self-representation a little bit later. And just uh, before doing that, I say some words about what Dwetji may consider. The term is mostly used to describe a specific work that is created by hand and anchored in a Sami activity and reality. Uh, Dwetji has then its origin in, in the everyday life. And um, Oti uh, talked very, very closely and very clearly about what, what Dwetji has been in, in this everyday lifetime. The activities, the conventions, the aesthetic understanding has been formed within the everyday life. In the course of time, the concept Dwetje has assumed, of course, several meanings. We can say that Dwetje refers to all form, forms of act, creative expressions that require human thought and production, but it it cannot automatically be um, translated into English and say it's art. So from approximately 1900, in the starting start of 1900 onwards, the Sami movements was founded with the aim of mobilize, mobilizing the Sami to participate in social activities, and to strengthen the belief that the Sami are equal and as human beings to majority communities. The movement uh, cul culminated with the Alta action in the, on the Norwegian side in 1970, uh, end of 1970s. The Alta resistance brought with a new perspective also on Dwetje. The use of Dwetje gave people power. The Sami stood up, united and naked, in the sense that they did not attempt to hide their identity, crying out, here we are, and here we shall remain. But from the Alta action until today, it has taken further 40 years of struggling just when I myself started to, uh, st started to study Dwetje at the university level in 1990s, it was still very strange for the universities to, to talk about Dwetje as an art discipline. And I was often questioned of my choice of uh, artistic work and research theme. So 
how can this colonialism still be so strong? Because colonial, colonization makes an impact both on the people who are colonized and on the colonizers. That is what we must talk here on the one hand about how indigenous people ha peoples have survived and adapted to their situation with difficult cultural and uh, political consequences. And on the other hand, how the colonizers have created and maintained a certain image of indigenous people in order to control their representation. Maori scientist Linda Tuhiva Smith has outlined a model of, model of indigenous research methodology, methodology, which can also be adapted to indigenous art. For her, self-determination in research agenda becomes something more than a political goal. She can see similarities between, between research in common and indigenous research. And this is also that I can see um, uh, is um, common between um, uh, art in common and indigenous art. Though there are elements that she, uh, Tuya Smith, uh, she means are different and which involves the process of transformation, of decolonization of healing and that is what what also um, Odi is very clearly speaking about the healing process and also the mobilization as people this mobilization you find in the art, art area as well as we have seen examples of here the experience are uh, experiences are based upon personal commitment but but what experience are we discussing? As, an, as I understand Tuhiva Smith, she is referring to the certain nas nations' experience of colonization and how this has affected the people, both parts. Her opinion is that since the no knowledge of indigenous people ha has not been visible in the building of knowledge, the consequence is that the indigenous people have themselves rejected their own system of using knowledge. Once a system of knowledge has been rejected in order to restore it, it is necessary to uh, raise awareness, make change and improvement. Uh, this is also that something that Asta Balto, researcher, Sami researcher Alta Balto and uh, Dr. Vuoko Hirvonen see the same tendency in the Sami context. And that is why Graham Smith is talking of indigenizing of the knowledge and take the tool in your own hands, so to say. And the, the, that is why I also mentioned this um, AIDA project that really is trying to take the tool in in our own hands and start to see what, how can we indigenize the archives and also the museum collections. For instance, for instance, the choice of the word data, art, can be an example of how Sami have taken the middle way in the decolonizing process. Art is closely linked to the European history and therefore the history of indigenous peoples, Tuetji and Dadja have been outside or sometimes within the history, depending on the ideological time or in the art world and also, of course, the museum world. The Sami language is an important tool for reflection on Tuetji from a theoretical point of view as uh, and is a fundamental source of understanding Tuetji. Uh, a word-by-word -word translation from the Sami language to another language of 
of course, is sometimes needed. But this translation also involves values that are embedded in the new language. What influence did the use of the language have on our Sami people, Stwetki? It may not be possible to escape from the established concept, but using them, them within a new content is possible and is part of the decolonization. When this, uh, for instance, when the Sami Association, Arts Association, Sami Daita Chepi was founded in 1979, artists asked themselves what to call the new association. Sami artists wanted to, to be part of the International Art Society and represent themselves. Excuse me, go on. Yes. Uh, we are running a little late. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering if you could, um, uh, if you would like to get to a conclusion or if you would um, yeah. like to say more. Um, yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Sorry. Have I used my 15 minutes? Yes, and, and uh, we are a little bit late, uh, unfortunately. Okay. So that is why. Uh, okay. The concept representation can be di divided in different parts. So wha what is my... Uh, my main um, main point is that the self representation is very important when when we are discussing the decolonizing process uh, and self representation when using uh, in Dutchi emphasizes and makes visible the discourse of Sami Dutchi from the point of view of of, of uh, the Sami people. And still, the uh, self-representation also runs into difficulties, since the understanding of Dwetji is almost bred in the bone of all of us. Uh, Dwetji and art contributes actively. actively uh, <laughs> Dwetji and art contributes actively through its products to the social discussions on decolonizing processes. This process deals with the, both political and art forms. This means that the cultural expression like art is not separated from the social life. Artists join and shape the discussions through their works, as we can see now with the work of, for instance, Odi Bieski. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Thank uh, you so much, and I hope we can come back to to um, these topics uh, in the Q and A, which will also have to be a little bit uh, briefer. Um, and uh, to finish, then we have our uh, final speaker, um, which is, who, who's um, Elin Kristina Haugdal, uh, professor in art history uh, at the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, who has co-edited the anthology Semi Art and Aesthetics and has worked on, on issues of public art, monuments, monumentality, and, and Sami architecture. So welcome. And, and also, and, and, and again, I, I could say this beforehand, that since we're a little long, short on time, if you uh, have the possibility to, to maybe um, cut a minute or two, that would be um, appreciated. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Maybe you have to help me with the, with the Absolutely. Try. Of <laughs> course. I'll try. Of course. Okay. And hello from Tromsø, Northern Norway. I'm at my office at the Department uh, of Language and Culture. And I'm really honored to take part in this event. So thank you everyone and for your presentation so far. Um, I want to share some of my reflections on two directions as architecture and as artwork. Uh, and I want to share some pictures with you. that is working. So, um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to visit Stockholm after the inauguration of this uh, piece of art, this new entrance. So I'm going to use the pictures that I find on <clears throat> the beautiful websites on these institutions here today. Um, I'm invited to this uh, conversation, I suppose, because I've been concerned with contemporary Sami architecture and questions of representation, heritage and identity and monumentality, which necessarily 
touch upon questions of decolonialism and postcolonialism. I have looked into the first museum buildings in Sápmi, raised at the end of the 1960s, into the new churches and schools from the 1970s, cultural centers from the 80s and 90s, the parliament buildings after the millennium, and even more museums. These Sámi institutions are part of a long, ongoing political struggle for independence. And in all these public buildings, Sami artists have been involved either through singular artworks or through total design concepts. Their works are more than pure decoration, more than applied art, more than just an addition. The works of art situate the buildings, the public buildings, in place and time and give them identity as Sami, a kind of belonging. Uh, also, Odin PSG has uh, made uh, artworks for public buildings in in um, in um, Among others, she has made an artwork for the extended wing of the Sami Parliament building in Norway. The long corridor is filled with trolls, overlapping, blurring into a colorful space. They are produced with the techniques and materials of Dulce. And in the assembly hall in the Sami parliament in Finland, leaves of the popular Sami brooch are enlarged and hang freely on the wall in the plenary meeting hall. So there's multiplication and magnification, the playing with the sizes of things, seems to be one of Audubieski's artistic methods in whatever material or media she chooses. And I will return to this very soon as perhaps a decolonial strategy. But first, I find it quite interesting that back in the 1880s, the end of the 20th, 19th century, in the International Architectural Competition for Nordiska Museet, none of the proposals for the museum building were accepted because they were considered not to be, I quote, sufficiently Nordic in nature. And in the Renaissance inspired building, which actually was completed in 1904, it is hard for us today to spot the Nordic identity. But some sources highlight qualities like letting the daylight in and the use of local stone. Others point to the Nordic iconography in the carved figures throughout the building from gods to animals. And others again argues with the imprint of Nordic artists. And in any case, it seems high time to discuss, discuss the Nordicness of the Nordic Museum anew, including the Saminess of the museum. And this new entrance is a place to start. So this elongated, barrel vaulted volume is projected into the old museum's stone wall through one of the former window bays. The connection between the old and the new is done with great care, as underscored by the architect, Lone Pia Bach, who is also a professor in architectural conservation. There are a lot of examples of far more brutal or aggressive museums extensions the last decades, which really in, uh, intend to expose difference. This do not. In this case, the, the size, the form, and also the materials chosen are adapted to the situation. So-called cotton steel dominates, sometimes known as bedded steel, reflects the spots of iron in the local sandstones used in the old museum. Um, it gives a firm construction. It is rough and sustainable. So both in harmony, but also in contrast with the existing building. A new entrance, this new entrance negotiates and uh, negotiates between the massive facade and the scale of the intended social life in the backyard. Inside this long entrance passage, the rusty steel is combined with smooth and warm oak in the details, which is closest to the body, like handrails and door frames. The monochrome space let the ornamental patterns in the glassed walls and in the perforated ceiling develop in different kinds of lights. The ceiling held up uh, or a load-bearing steel frame makes the space appear as a kind of baldakin, maybe. Baldakin, originally the name of a type of, type 
type of silk brocade from Baghdad and subsequently used to describe a ceiling or cloth worn in procession uh, or mounted over a seat as a symbolic protection and a sign of dignity. Later on, it has become a permanent architectural feature, a ceremonial canopy of stone or metal over an altar, a throne or a doorway. The entrance to a building, the doorway, portal, threshold, passage, is one of the most significant elements in architecture as a transition from one place to another. In the traditional Sami tent or turf hut or kote, the entrance part is called uksa, as Audubieski already has explained to us. But sorry for me repeating. But, uh, and it is symbolically related, related to the female goddess Uksaka, who takes care of the birth and the child's entrance into the life. And some architectural historians describe more generally the entrance as an existential experience. And in the history of high Western architecture, of which Nudes Camusia is a part, the entrance is formed according to ideals of style and proportion, and the doorway is often, uh, often, often elevated and centralized and in focus. The main entrance is accentuated as a powerful transition. For short, the entrance is monumental, or the place where monumentality performs. The monumentality of this new entrance, the artwork, two directions, is of another kind. The high staircases of the museum's main doors are gone, and the leveled passage gives universal access. Automatic sliding doors open magically and let you into the museum space. The main facade's strong focal point is replaced by glass, light, reflections, and ornamental patterns, or eyes are oscillating between foreground and background, the crisscrossing pattern on the glass blurring with the brick stones of the old museum building. As the Finnish architect Johan Palisma has told us, it is when our eyes lose focus that our bodily experience become the strongest. However, the perceptual and dynamic aspects of the ornamental seem subordinated to the ornament as communication in this case, as identity mark, as a material and visual heritage. Not everyone is familiar with the historical origin of the, uh, of the geometrical pattern in the walls and the ceiling, but we are told and we learn that it is taken from a southern Sami antler spoon in the museum's collection. And that this is only a fragment of a larger history. When we see this small spoon, either in the showcase or held in the white clothes of the museum director, the poetic words of a Swedish art critic come true, to me at least. I quote, It is wrong to think that monumentality is the same as greatness, that a thing is monumental because it feels bigger than it act actually is. On the contrary, a monumental thing feels smaller than it actually is. And this smaller than presses the things matter together in our imagination. The matter seems compressed and that compression is monumentality." End of quote, in my translation. In Odebieski's artworks, there uh, is this strong tension between the small and the big, the bigger than or the smaller than. She's playing with sizes, the relative extent, uh, extent of things, the dimension of things, She's playing with fragments and worldings. And in two directions, she opens a larger space to the compressed materiality of the spoon, a space that magnified the museum item to be recognized through our bodily experiences as we are literally walking through it. Few contemporary artists work so close to the Sami tradition as Pieski does, but in the use, uh, both in the use of traditional handicraft and also in her choice of recognizable motifs and objects, like the shawl, the sami hat, the brooch, the gakti, actually objects closest to the body. But often taking these well-known forms and motifs and blowing them up to, to big size results in the ridiculous or in kitsch. This has been the critique against the uh, giant level syndrome, to use the artist Yuan term 
in much postmodern architecture. Sami signs and symbols are appropriated and blown up to make monumental impression and secure Sami identity. It's bigger than. However, in this case, the transformation from the small format of the spoon to the large ceiling seems eligible and a kind of appreciation rather than appropriation. The artist draws, twists, stretches, scales up and down, values, transfers into new landscape or new materials and explores the potential in the heritage, in the hat, the brooch, the cacti, or in the ornamental patterns on a small spoon. Doyar and PhD in art history, uh, actually from the University of Tromsø, Maya Dunfjell, who uh, was mentioned before, uh, she had studied in detail the antler spoons from the South Sami area, also those in the collection at the Nordiska Museet. And she describes in her doctoral thesis how she had to do more than just describe these items in words to understand them. She tells she had to draw the patterns again and again without coping to come closer to their real meaning, function and value. Dunfjell's experience by drawing these forms and ornaments demonstrates at the same time the living dynamics of the Sami culture. And likewise, PSK has studied, sketched, scaled and valued the ornament of the spoon and magnified this little everyday object to a Sami baldakin that expand the visitor's space of understanding. And just two remarks at the end, if there still is some time left. If there is such a thing as a decolonial aesthetics, it is not recognizable in a common visual or material language. Most important is that decolonizing aesthetic practices have to be invented every time in a direct response to the specific situation, to the colon colonializing power, which in this case is the Nordisk Museum, to its building and collection. And this invention is the work of the artist. And my question is, how should the museum keep this entrance alive as an ongoing decolonial practice? How to avoid these ornamental forms ending up as inert, literal meaning, lacking the ability or the strength, or the strength to move? How to, to let it keep telling meaningful stories? And how to keep the visitors and the museum institution on alert? This is the old concept of monumentality. The architecture should remind us and warn us on a danger, how to keep alert to colonial past and for the future, to make repatriation a real act, to quote ODBSK. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have some time for um, questions and answers. And um, I have prepared a few uh, questions in general, but I would also uh, like to open up for um, part, partly for our, our viewers to ask us questions, uh, which are very welcome, and also for um, our participants, both we are sitting here and and all of us, Uti, um, Gunvor, and Elin, who are with us uh, through Link, to um, ask questions for each other. Um, so I might start basically, and also maybe um, touching on this question um, that you uh, so generously provided, uh, Elin. Uh, if there, are, uh, if there are any questions already that you have uh, um, for each other, perhaps going into um, the materiality of the artwork, one thing that interested me uh, and that I saw coming up in these in this in these discussions is this uh, question of scale, uh, which I think, uh, with the risk of getting metaphorical, could be applied to. Uh, uh, both sort of the scale, the, the, va the various scales in the artwork, as, as Elin showed, um, as well as these these questions that are brought up, uh, that Oti brought up, that Gunnar brought up, and that you brought up, uh, that these questions of decolonization and and repatriation, rematriation, um, are questions which are on the one hand uh, questions of very intimate scale, and at the va and at the other hand, um, at the same time questions of, um, uh, of, of, of um, as on a societal scale, uh, on a transnational scale. So Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah. I would like to uh, 
make a reflection on your question. I think it, it, it's a very important uh, issue which has come up, scale, as you noticed. Uh, in, in most people have talked about this, the scale issue, so I'm, I'm happy you commented upon it. And um, uh, f uh, for me, it has, been, it has been an issue. It has been actually very important uh, that is a small or, or that is, is um, patterns that you normally associate with small objects that they did get this uh, monumentality and 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 really got up into an impressive scale and the thing is and and the reason is that here i think the museum is making a statement um we we are doing a statement here. We are saying that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the the objects that we have in our collections, uh, some of them they may be small, but the issue is big, and um, the uh, the um, the chapter in in Swedish and Nordic history and in and in world history, which is about uh, Samian identities, Samian histories, and so forth is not explored and is not taken into uh, is, is not integrated into um, into Swedish or national or Nordic or or, or global uh, history and and we and I think that the scale uh, which we now have <laughs> is, is extremely important because it also makes the statement to me at least that this is not just handy just which is an awful word but is it's not just handicraft it's actually also art uh, and uh, art is something that i don't know what the art council says but uh, art is something that takes national pride much more than handicraft and uh, and so so i think the moment you get up into scale then you are also uh, also blowing up the picture on a much more uh, national issue mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. so yes scale i i think uh, has been an issue yes it has mm -hmm. been important and with that and also the the mm -hmm. question of of the arts and, and the role mm -hmm. of and, and the question of decolonizing the, the I'm, mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the the question of decolonizing the archive mm -hmm. and so maybe uh, we could return to to you Gunvor, um, also since i uh, unfortunately had to uh, cut you off a little bit at the end um, also, if you have uh, some thoughts, perhaps, on, on what has been said, and also uh, how this, uh, um, the question of, of, of the scale and what, what is to b of what is to be done. Um. Well, um, first of all, I have to, uh, I of course, I disagree with the, with the director that. Uh, uh, Dochi is uh, handicraft because, uh, as uh, as both uh, Elin and Odi has uh, pointed out, and that uh, this uh, Dochi products have uh, um, ha have in themselves a lot of stories. So um, I understand that um, this is also a part of the. Ha uh, this is also part of how how um, the the official established uh, museums archives ha have looked upon uh, uh, Dochi that uh, those small tiny uh, works are just um, handicrafts, while if you come up to a bigger scale. It becomes art, and and on the other hand, uh, we have a lot of. Elin um, uh, showed a lot of um, examples of uh, how doyarat, uh, those who who are trained, uh, trained by their, themselves to be doyar, actually have started to work with the bigger scales, also to be part of the 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 um, uh, to represent themselves to to show that they are able to part of this uh, bigger discussion of uh, and i i still will call what they work with is because they use their knowledge 
they use their uh, capacity of working, for instance, uh, uh, Folke Fjellström, who has been working on large scales for many 10 years. He, he, has, uh, he is a very good craftsperson, and you can actually see that he is coming from a Dutchy background when he is working with, with these big scales, large scales. So uh, you actually can see how, how Duayarat, how the craftspeople can, um, can contribute with new knowledge or uh, new knowledge that perhaps is not so, so uh, common to uh, galleries and uh, museums and so forth. Thank you so, very much. So, so that, that is a uh, very interesting uh, point of view. Thank you so much. Uh, um, you, yes, would you please uh, yeah, say that? Because I want to um, address a question that has yeah. come up in the chat, uh, first of all, uh, which is uh, how come an event uh, discussing decolonization at the Swedish National Museum located in Stockholm does not include any Sami organizations like Sami Tinget or Sami Föreningen in Stockholm? And this is, um, uh, I think, a question uh, which can be answered in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, and thank you for that question. Uh, one of, of course is that we are discussing, we are uh, currently discussing uh, the artwork, and as uh, part of the uh, Public Art Agency Sweden's uh, uh, program series, we are inviting uh, artists and researchers uh, from from various contexts um, to discuss this. But I think it also pr uh, points to uh, questions which have have been brought up uh, today about um, the role of institutions and and. Uh, um, and uh, which institutions are, are present where. Uh, so, thank you for that question. Uh, and then, Peter, if you would like to respond. No, I think I think also you... Well, when, when you're describing this artwork, this fantastic artwork by Udo Pesky, I think it's so nice to think about it, not just as uh, something that's magnified, uh, because it's so much more. Uh, it's um, the, the, the trick in this... Uh, uh, artwork is, of course, that you are immersed by by this surrounding of of a, a, a culture uh, on the entrance, and I think that's a focal point that we should not. Uh, I, I bring it back to the artwork itself and and experience what how you experience as a, as a as a viewer or as a uh, as a person who actually encounter it. Mm. So I think that's uh, more more to. I know that we need to finish, but. Uh, I think that's a focal thing. It's not so easy as just making it bigger. Mm. It, it's a situation that, that Uti has um, treated with such um, elegance, I think. Yeah. That's right, and I, I think that is also something that um, Elin brought up uh, quite nicely in, in, in describing uh, the artwork. And um, I'm wondering uh, if Uti, if you would like to uh, say something about, uh, uh, about that question and the sort of experience of it. Yeah, thank you. It was so, uh, I totally agree with the Gunvor, what she said, she put her words so well. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's a question about scale. It easily goes to um, this kind of like political questions of uh, where where do we show our visual uh, tradition in, in general? Like uh, uh, why, why, why our, like the Sami tradition, why it is presented uh, mostly in the ethnographical museums, while the uh, Western uh, cultural heritage is, uh, is presented in the art museums. And, and we know the uh, really big like value difference between, between those places. And uh, that is, uh, I feel like really important and uh, question, like uh, conversation. And, and this is like uh, what I see, uh, uh, if if the, uh, there is a Sami exhibition in the Ethnographical Museum, for example, in the Nordic, Nordiska Museet, and it's uh, created and built up by, by Sami themselves, and it's uh, talking about our perspective, it, will, it would totally 
change the situation and it, it would show all these uh, objects from different point of view. And I feel it like it's so uh, interesting to everybody, not only for us, how we want to show our um, cultural heritage, but it's so interesting for everybody. So I don't ha uh, have any idea why, why should anybody else uh, build up these uh, exhibitions uh, in the museums than the person the persons that are have the belonging to to those uh, objects. So uh, I I I just feel like uh, so strongly that uh, that there is a good very very good two choices to to Nordisk museet also one in Finland and one in Norway like. You you could you can uh, repatriate half of the uh, objects as they have done in Norway, and uh, or then you can repatriate all of the objects. Like in in Finland, they, there is a process going on, and still have an exhibition about Sami objects in in also in the International Museum. We don't like uh, make that in, impossible. Thank you very much, Oti, um, and. So I think we can uh, maybe finish there uh, if there are no more questions from, from the audience. Uh, so we'll let you, I will finish there and I want to thank all of the participants. Thank you so much for being here, Sanne, Nessa, Peter, Oti, Elin and Gunvor. All right, thank you.